All right, School Idol Festival was good, but I need something stronger. What do you got for free mobile phone rhythm games? Well, got some School Idol Festival too. No, I need something harder. Okay, Hotshot, I got Project Sekai over here. All your favorite Vocaloid songs, ripping queer storytelling, and Hatsune Miku is there. Hatsune Miku? Are you trying to tell me that you got your hands on some Miku? 100% pure. Guaranteed. You set me up! In 2004, Yamaha released the first version of Vocaloid on the world. Using this novel software, creators would compose lyrics and melodies which would come to life via Virtual Singer. The singers included in the software were each based on real vocalists with the promise of allowing a composer to use them as a stand-in for a real singer. Each of the synthesizers was also bundled with a character design to sell the idea that a Vocaloid is more than just a virtual instrument, it's more like a singer in a box. And it's that combination of technology and characterization that makes Vocaloids what they are. While critics praised the first iteration of the software as an important first step in the messy process of trying to recreate the human voice, the target audience of professional producers didn't see the appeal of learning this complicated software over and above just hiring a flesh and blood singer for a 30 minute session, and consequently the product failed to find commercial success. However, development would continue and a second iteration of the Vocaloid software would release in 2007. This new version came with a complete overhaul of both the user interface and the vocal engine, making the product both easier to use and better sounding. While critics did note the improvements in Vocaloid 2, the software couldn't overcome one of its biggest challenges, the human ear. Our brains are extremely good at picking up faults in speech, and the singer in a box premise was still just a little bit too uncanny to pick up wider adoption. So despite praise, the initial reception to the June launch of Vocaloid 2 was lukewarm. However, that was going to change in a big way a few months later with the release of Hatsune Miku. Yes, that Hatsune Miku. The one from the internet. Miku was the first Vocaloid developed by Krypton Future Media and based on the iconic voice of Saki Fujita. This also makes her the first Vocaloid not based on a professional singer. But users didn't seem to mind at all. The reaction to Hatsune Miku's release was both immediate and monumental. At a time where selling 1,000 copies of a synthesizer was considered a commercial success, Miku sold 40,000 copies in the first year of her release. Now, over 15 years since her debut, Miku remains an enduring global icon. She's met Scarlett Johansson. She's appeared in commercials for brands like Toyota and Domino's. Since 2010, Hokkaido has hosted a Snow Miku Winter Festival every single year. Miku's been featured on race cars via Good Smile Racing. She's also performed for David Letterman. She was going to perform at Coachella 2020 before it was canceled. Did I mention that she's been to space? The cultural impact of Hatsune Miku is undeniable, but how exactly did we get here? How did a vocal synthesizer become a global icon? Like the previous version, Vocaloid 2 was initially marketed to professional producers as a replacement for a human singer, but it was in the hobbyist market where the software initially made an impact, and boy did it make an impact. Hatsune Miku also happened to land at a critical junction in the history of the internet. Just one year prior to the release of Vocaloid 2 in 2006, Google purchased YouTube and Nico Nico Doga launched in Japan, creating two cornerstones of what we now know as modern video sharing. These websites, and others like them, allowed creators to easily post their works and connect with each other. This created a thriving community of independent composers, artists, and animators whose work could reach into the millions of views without any need for traditional promotion. Take the case of Supercell, for example. Rio, the group's composer and lyricist, posted the song Melt to Nico Nico in December of 2007. To his surprise, Melt was a hit on the site. He had accompanied his song with an illustration used without the artist's permission, prompting Rio to reach out to Hikeshi, the artist in question, to apologize. Hikeshi, however, was already very aware of Melt, and that apology turned into a collaboration between the two that would form the foundation of Supercell, 
a group that would go on to produce multiple gold albums and eventually sign a record deal with Sony. If you've watched any popular animations in the past decade or so, and let's be real, you're here. Maybe you've seen Bakamona Guitari, Guilty Crown, or Psycho Pass, and if you have, you've heard Ryo's works in the openings and endings of those shows. The impact of the creative culture around Vocaloid also extended internationally. Porter Robinson, for example, has talked about how Vocaloid music changed his life and has remained a key influence for him in his own career. He's even loaned his own voice to a recently released Vocaloid. The diversity of projects including the character is staggering, in no small part due to the flexibility of Miku as a character. But no matter what she looks or sounds like, the spirit of open collaboration and making connections through music is at the heart of what Hatsune Miku, and by extension, Vocaloid more broadly, is all about. It's also the focus of the actual topic of this video, the mobile game Project Sakai Colorful Stage featuring Hatsune Miku, also known internationally as Hatsune Miku Colorful Stage. My own history with this game is relatively recent. I only became aware of it when a friend and I were at round one trying to win Among Us plushies out of one of the UFO catchers. Eventually, they pulled their phone out, booted up a game I didn't recognize, and when I asked them what it was, they told me it was Project Sekai, a game with grippingly accurate stories about queer life, and also Hatsune Miku is there. And I thought they were joking, but I was wrong. I was so, so wrong. Project Sekai is an offshoot of the Project Diva rhythm game series that launched for mobile in 2020 with a global version landing in late 2021. The game is set in the real world, where Miku and the other Vocaloids exist as fictional singers, but they also exist in Sekai, a kind of parallel dimension that takes on an appearance to match the feelings of the people in it. Different groups of people are invited into the Miku dimension, where the Vocaloids help them resolve their dilemmas and make connections through music. It's basically Digimon, but featuring Hatsune Miku. When you first launch the game, it asks you to take a short personality test and either because I'm gay, because I'm depressed, or maybe just because I like the color purple, I was assigned to the group Night Chord at 2500. Unlike the other groups in the game that perform live, Night Chord only posts their collective work online and both their real names and faces are unknown to their fans. It's a story that reflects the history of the Vocaloid series' own roots on sites like YouTube and Nico Nico. Night Chord is also what my friend was referring to when they told me that this game had startlingly effective portrayals of queer life, specifically via the character Mizuki. Officially, Mizuki's gender is listed as unknown. In the Japanese version of the game, they refer to themselves with Boku, a first-person pronoun typically used by either young boys or tomboyish girls. In the English localization of the game, Mizuki is referred to with both feminine and gender-neutral pronouns interchangeably without a clear preference for either. The topic of the character's gender is apparently so contentious that the comment section of their fandom page had to be locked down. For this video, I'm going to use they-them pronouns to refer to the character, and I'm also going to lump them under the broad umbrella of trans identities. Please, don't yell at me over it. The topic of the character's relationship with gender, and how it impacts their relationships with other people, is the focal point in their personal story. It's early in the main Night Chord storyline that we learn that Mizuki rarely attends school. One of those early story chapters picks up during one of the rare occasions where they do come to class, and right away they can hear students whispering them saying things like, I'm telling you, you can't tell, super cute too, and I've never seen them before in person either. If you didn't mention it, I wouldn't have even noticed. Even though these students might think they're whispering, Mizuki can hear everything that they're saying, but they brush it off because this isn't the first time that this has happened. If anything, it's a normal occurrence whenever they come to class. To other students, Mizuki's presentation is a spectacle that's openly gossiped about regardless of whether or not they're even at school that day. They're an oddity, and treated more like a zoo animal than a classmate. And while it's not directly stated, it's likely that this treatment is the reason they only attend school when it's absolutely necessary. It's later in the same story section that two other students ask Mizuki if they would like to walk home together. Along the way, they chat about how other students can be so rude, and how if anything like this ever happens again, Mizuki should come and find them. And let's be real, the way all this is framed makes it seem like this kind of thing happens all the time. After the group splits, Mizuki decides to go shopping instead of heading directly home. 
And it's there they overhear those same two classmates speaking about them with a very different tone. Now, they're saying things like, some people just really don't know how to fit in, and if they didn't want to be the center of attention, maybe they should dress normal. As an academic, my research background is in the study of biases, and in that world of bias research, there's a line drawn between hostile and benevolent isms, like racism and sexism. It would be simple to write a storyline here about a more hostile and overt transphobia. Another student could insult Mizugi to their face, or this storyline could be about how they're being bullied at school and that's why they don't come to class. Instead, we get something more insidious. None of the comments that they overhear are overtly negative. In fact, some are even complimentary, but in a way that's objectifying and isolating. Even the two students that Mizuki overhears in the mall, insisting that they need to be more normal if they don't want to get that kind of attention, are still very keen to say the right things in public while being secretly judgmental. This kind of thing is very common. It was actually a major factor in my departure from academia after I finished my degree. I was disheartened to find how often people would be very good at saying the right things in public while being judgmental about me behind my back. And wild guess here, but I'm going to assume that I am not the only person with those kinds of stories to tell. Needless to say, this is not a level of nuance that I was expecting from the free-to-play Hatsune Miku mobile rhythm game. Unlike other similar games I've played that have a rotating set of time-limited events, Focus of Engine Project Sekai are chronological, allowing for characters to follow an arc across a continuous storyline. The first event to focus on Mizuki is the Kamiyama High Festival, which, as the name implies, follows Mizuki as they attend their school festival. Despite an initial hesitation, their friend and classmate Anne encourages them that it will be safe and that no one is going to hassle them. Despite that, the day starts off rough when Anne gives Mizuki a t-shirt that their class had designed. It's their uniform for the event. But without anywhere private to change, Mizuki has to turn it down. It's a one-off line, and then the story moves on, but in doing so, it's also showing how this is just one more issue that Mizuki is very used to dealing with at this point. As somebody who's also dealt with not always knowing which public bathroom to use, well, this also landed pretty well for me. The event picks up with Mizuki hanging out with different characters before ultimately reconnecting with a former middle school classmate. The two had previously bonded over their mutual feelings of loneliness and habit of hiding on the school's roof to avoid people. In the flashbacks that lay this all out, Mizuki is noticeably more masculine, and in a brilliant piece of vocal direction, Hinata Sato, their voice actress, shifts her vocal resonance to sound more masculine. It's something that I appreciate tremendously. As someone with a voice that sounds, at least to my own ear, very clockable, I'm not used to hearing voices that sound like mine, even coming from ostensibly trans characters. I didn't even recognize Hinata Sato's voice at first, even though I'm a big fan of her performance in Review Starlight as Juna. It's an exceptional piece of characterization and texture that really adds something to Mizuki's character and highlights the contrast between their past and present selves. As the event wraps up, Mizuki says that they're glad to see that Rui, their former classmate, seems to have managed to make good friends. However, when Rui turns that back around and says the same about Mizuki, they initially deflect it. Mizuki doesn't trust their friendships with other people, and even hesitates to say that the people that they have at this point spent the whole day with are their friends. That insecurity is a theme that's focused on more in later events. The next focus event, Secret Distance, follows the members of Night Chord as they take a trip to get to know each other better. It concludes with Mizuki being the only one of the four still awake on the bus ride home and realizing that, for the first time, they want these relationships to last. They want to start making deeper connections with people, but their chest tightens with the realization that doing so is going to mean being vulnerable. And being vulnerable might mean having to disclose their personal history, i.e. having to come out to the other members of the group. More so than anybody else, they have been keeping secrets from the other members of the group. Much like the devil in the classic Twilight Zone episode, The Howling Man. It's a realization that they continue to unpack in the third focus event, What Lies Behind, What Lies Ahead. It picks up directly from the previous event, with Mizuki caught in a full-blown mental tailspin between their desire to be more open about themselves and the fear that opening up could cause their relationships to change. 
Surely the other members of the group would understand, they might even know something already. The group's illustrator, after all, attends night classes at the same high school where we know that other students openly gossip about Mizuki. And even if she doesn't know, her younger brother attends classes at the same school during the day. There's also an overworld conversation where the group's composer notes how Mizuki's voice has a unique character that nobody else in the group can replicate, prompting Mizuki to wonder what it is that she might be implying. But despite all that, they cannot bring themselves to open up, because they have internalized all of those whispers that they've overheard in the classroom. And they cannot bring themselves to trust that anyone would accept them for who they are. It's not all bad news, though. The most recent focus event that has yet to come to the global servers expands on Mizuki's past and specifically their relationship with their older sister. In the event, their sister is leaving to study abroad. And on the eve of her departure, she stops to gift Mizuki a dress form in the event that they ever decide to start making clothes again, a ribbon, and also a parting message that I'm going to have to paraphrase. <clears throat> I've noticed you giving up on things that you used to enjoy and seeming unhappy about it. I'm not going to make you tell me what's going on, but you need to know that there isn't anywhere that you don't belong. And no matter who you are or where you go, I am on your side. And I just know that there are people out there who are going to understand you. That same ribbon also features heavily in several of Mizuki's character cards. Looking at some of them now, it's powerful the way that this story recontextualizes that ribbon as more than just a cute thing that Mizuki likes, but rather a gift from an older sibling that came along with the reminder that they are not wrong for doing things that make them happy. Altogether, these events tell the story of a character that is struggling to accept acceptance. And just to belabor the point, all of this is part of the free-to-play Hatsune Miku mobile game, and I've barely even touched on the other characters, many of which also have similarly poignant stories, like Enna's issues with imposter syndrome and perfectionism around her art. I don't know what I was expecting when I downloaded this game, but it certainly was not this. I'm probably more than a few years older than the target demographic for this game, and as a queer woman in her thankfully still early 30s, I was in high school around the release of Hatsune Miku. I even remember seeing those weird Toyota ads on TV. And with playing this game, it makes it hard for me to not be a little bit envious of younger people who get to have media like this during their own adolescence. Growing up in the 90s, any accessible trans representation fell into one of two camps. In her book Whipping Girl, Julia Serrano describes them as the deceiver or the clown. A deceiver is trying to, well, deceive other characters and is typically conventionally attractive and quote-unquote passing. The clown is a more masculine appearing character that is there to either be mocked or pitied depending on the context. And even between these two, queer representation and especially explicitly trans characters were still very rare. Even though I knew that I was a girl from the moment that I knew that boys and girls were treated differently, I didn't have the language to describe that, at least until I watched a little movie called Ace Ventura Pet Detective. You know, it's the movie where the climax has the hero expose the villain's genitals to a crowd of police, causing everyone to start vomiting. I've also learned that I'm not alone in how much this scene impacted me. It is a genuine, generational event of internalized transphobia for many queer women my age and older. It is so transphobic that even Joe Rogan got the point, and that's how I learned that I wasn't alone. It also taught me that I should be disgusted with myself. It wasn't until many years later that I would talk to another actual trans person on the internet, unfortunately on 4chan's anime board, in threads about gender-bending shows like Comfort and Maria Holic. It's always a little funny to me to think back on it, because soy is such a reactionary meme now, but the first time that I heard about the connection between soy and estrogen was back in those threads. Really, they were less about the shows, and they were more of a coy way to talk about how to discreetly do DIY hormone replacement therapy. Can't say that it worked, but it probably played a role in why I'm still mostly a vegetarian to this day. I came of age at a time when Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune couldn't be on TV unless they were depicted as cousins, so I am floored not only by the quality of the writing here, 
but also the accessibility of these stories. Sure, it's not perfect, but it's hard not to be a little bit jealous. My adolescence might have been a little bit brighter if I had been able to download a free mobile phone game or turn on a TV and see a character like myself treated with empathy or even dignity. As much as I think that representation isn't an inherently good thing in and of itself, and it wouldn't have changed my material reality, I do think that media can move people's imaginations. And it might have helped me feel a little bit less helpless as my body was going through changes that I did not want and did not understand. And that's without even talking about all the kinds of social media and video sharing that exist today that was essential to the success of Vocaloid in the first place. But more than any of that, I'm just glad that this exists, and it seems like younger people have it a little bit better than I did. And that's what I've got for this time, so until next video, thank you for sharing your time with me, be nice to yourself, and thank you, Hatsune Miku.